Welcome. Thank you so much for continuing to ride with us as we journey through the Bible, as we look at these strong, powerful, or, and powerless women in the Old Testament. Today we're going to be talking about perhaps one of the most wrongly depicted p characters in the Bible, Bathsheba. And let me just tell you, Sherry Harris is so geeky when it comes to Bathsheba. You just bear with her. And I also have to point out that she is so maligned, this poor Bathsheba character, that I had trouble finding a picture of her with clothes on. Oh, my goodness. So, Sherry, go for it. Tell us about Bathsheba. Who is the real Bathsheba? Well, as you've already mentioned, uh, I believe Bathsheba uh, really is the most maligned uh, woman in possibly the entire scriptural record, and, and I'm very passionate about that. Um, she is portrayed, even today, as this beautiful, unscrupulous woman who seduced poor King David, and nothing could be farther from the truth truth. Uh, I think it's important to um, understand Bathsheba by looking at her background. She came from a very uh, connected, highly respected family. Both her father Eliam and her husband Uriah, they were members of King David's mighty men. Uh, King David was an extraordinary warrior. We know that. He defeated Goliath, but he could not win battles on his own. And so he was surrounded by these men that, who were later on called his mighty men, who were also great warriors who supported him uh, in his military endeavors and then later on in his political endeavors as well. Now her grandfather was David's chief counselor which put him even above the high priest. Very important position. He was very loyal to King David for a very long time but eventually he sided against David when one of David's sons Absalom rebelled against his father and attempted to take the uh, throne. And I've always wondered if part of of that was not uh, was because of how King David had treated his granddaughter Bathsheba. And then last but not least, remember this story is set in a patriarchal society where women had very little voice and very little power and um, most of their value was placed on whether they could have children, especially sons. Now when it comes to King David, we need to remember it is always good to be king. Now, um, winter in Israel is the rainy season. That is when the crops are planted. And that means that spring is a good time to go to war. Uh, so King David, when this story opens, actually should have been out with his troops fighting in the battlefield. But he wasn't. In fact... Scripture gives you a sense that something is about to go wrong. Mm -hmm. Because the scripture says, in the spring of the year when kings go to war, and instead of David going to war, he goes to the top of his palace to check out the scenery. <laughs> um, and what he did... Uh, why he, the reason he had the time to check out the scenery was he sent Joab, his general, out to lead the troops, and uh, he is in the wrong place at the long time, wrong time. I don't know if your mother said this, but my mom always used to tell me, you don't need to be there. That's a place where you can get in trouble. Well, it was exactly the same for King David as well. Now, uh, as sometimes the story goes, Bathsheba was on her rooftop bathing so she could seduce the king. Well, there's several things wrong with that. Number one, they didn't have indoor plumbing. Everybody bathed on their rooftops. King David's palace was the tallest building in uh, Jerusalem. He had a great view of all the rooftops. And uh, he was out there, and Bathsheba was bathing on her rooftop because she was a faithful Jew. She was performing the ritual ceremonial bathing required by the law of Moses for a woman who had completed her monthly cycle. However, she was a beautiful woman, and captivated by her beauty, he sends messengers to her to invite her to the palace. However, that translation can be, he took her, and that actually is more appropriate to the situation. Uh, remember, King David had absolute power, and women were powerless. Bathsheba's interval with King David resulted in a pregnancy, and this is a horrendous development for Bathsheba because she's totally at the mercy of the men in her life. Now, if her husband finds out that she is pregnant with another man's child, he can have her killed. But she cannot appeal for justice because it was the king who violated her. It was no different then than it is now. Those who have power have the responsibility. And those who have power have power over others. And 
I don't know where this idea of blaming Bathsheba for what happened came about because here's the important thing. This is not us looking back with 21st century sensibilities on the story of mm -hmm. Bathsheba. Nowhere in scripture does it say that Bathsheba was responsible for what happened. It does say that David was responsible for what happened. Yes, and the story only gets worse. Uh, David is basically trying to cover his tracks. Mm -hmm. So what he does is he has Uriah, Bathsheba, Bathsheba's husband, call back from the battlefield so that it will appear after spending time with his wife, that the baby belongs to him. But Uriah, who is a very righteous man, a very faithful soldier, he refuses to go to his wife while his men are sleeping on the battlefield and fighting for their lives. And so he essentially signs his own death warrant by, because of that behavior. Uh, and I think this is one of the, the most horrendous parts of this story. David sends him back to the battlefield carrying a letter to Joab, and the letter is telling Joab, put Uriah in the very front line of the battlefield and then pull the troops back so he will be fighting alone and he will die. And that is exactly what happened. Uh, this particular story really shows the insidious nature of sin. Uh, you know, sometimes it can it can start so simply. You know, you're just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Mm -hmm. You happen to see a beautiful yeah. woman uh, uh, bathing, and just one thing after another begins to happen, one sin after another. Um, sometimes I think it was almost like King David just woke up that morning and said, wow, I wonder how many Ten Commandments that I can break in a single day. Uh, another thing that we need to remember about Bathsheba, she really did love her husband, Uriah. Mm -hmm. And we have this slide where it shows Bathsheba mourning her husband. And so I think that's important to remember as well. Uh, her husband is dead. She is pregnant with the king's child. She marries King David, but the child dies. Uh, she has a second uh, child with King David, Solomon, uh, known as the great King Solomon. Now, King David promised Solomon would take the throne, but that was endangered by the internal strife within his family. Uh, multiple sons rebelled against their father and tried to take the throne. Now, years pass. David is very, very old, a very elderly king, almost bedridden, and Bathsheba knows that yet another son is rebelling, and he's going to take the throne is the moment King David dies. So she goes in to talk to King David. She reminds him of his promise to give the throne to her son, Solomon. And she also reminds him that uh, if she does not, both she and Solomon will both uh, most likely be killed. So as a result, Solomon is given the throne. He is a great son. He treats his mother with such respect and such love. Now, one of the things I think that uh, makes Bathsheba's story so powerful for our stories is the commonality. Uh, her life did not take the course mm -hmm. she anticipated. Okay. And none of us, I don't think any of us can say that our lives take the course that was anticipated. Uh, there are great joys in our life, and there are some really uh, problematic, sometimes horrible things we have to deal with. Um, Bathsheba's life really uh, took a turn she did not anticipate. There was rape. There was the murder of her husband. There was the death of her first child. She lost her home. She lost a husband she loved, Uriah. Yet she still found the power power within her to honor God and to change her world. And this, uh, that last slide was a photo when uh, Bathsheba went in front of King David. Now, uh, some scholars believe that these words found in Proverbs 31, 8 through 9 are Bathsheba's. Seek out on behalf of the voiceless and for the rights of all who are vulnerable. Speak out in order to judge with righteousness and defend the needy and the poor. Now, if these words do belong to Bathsheba, it shows this profound evolution of a woman from a, a very young beautiful, naive, kind of passive, powerless woman to somebody whose own pain and sorrow has inspired her to be an advocate for the least and the last and the lost and the people with no voice whatsoever. And I think it's very important for us to understand that because God uses women then and now to bring his kingdom in fact, if you'll notice, women don't speak a lot, particularly in the Old Testament. Well, really not much in the New Testament as well. But when they do speak out, 
They speak out on behalf of the voiceless. Mm -hmm. They speak out on behalf of the marginalized. They speak out on behalf of those who do not have power. Their own experiences of life, of power and powerlessness, lead them to speak out on behalf of those who have no voice. Mm -hmm. And that comes from their experience. So Absolutely. Bathsheba, who was the original Me Too, mm -hmm. she didn't have power, but she became bolder as she grew. And braver. And braver and wiser. And she spoke out on behalf of others. Mm -hmm. Bathsheba was a woman who, like so many women in the Old Testament and the New Testament, and even today, uh, she just did what had to be done. Because women always have and they always will.